After I retired from the Bishops' Conference, uh, my wife and I moved to Washington State, so now we're neighbors in the Pacific Northwest. I'm very happy to be invited here to Oregon Right to Life for the first time. I want to talk to you about something that uh, I think a lot of pro-life folks, well, a lot of people who are not geneticists themselves, don't really know enough about. And we've been there before. Uh, when human embryo research was being proposed, when embryonic stem cell research was proclaimed to be the path to miracle cures of all kinds, we had to educate ourselves pretty quickly to figure out enough of the science to engage in the moral debate. And that's where we are again. Less than six years ago, researchers discovered an easier and more effective way to modify the genetic makeup of any species, including us. Uh, Father Nicanor Ostriaco, who's a uh, scientist as well as a theologian, says this discovery will forever alter the landscape of medicine and science. And it raises some very serious moral issues as well. Some familiar to us in the pro-life movement and some that have really never been approached by our traditional moral categories in the past. This technology is moving forward very rapidly with very little public debate, except for statements by national resource, research organizations that are already fully committed to pursuing its application in human beings. And in pursuit of that, they are very committed to pursuing uh, ways to direct and influence the public debate to let them do what they already want to do. Already there's been a, a summit meeting of researchers, the National Academies of Sciences of the United States, where, of course, we have uh, lots of embryo research going on and bad stuff going on. The United Kingdom, which already is, has said they're going to allow what's called germline genetic engineering in humans, and the National Academy of Science for China, which, of course, has no moral problems, uh, but they do, you know, sort of kill political prisoners for their organs and stuff like that. So if you want a moral perspective on this debate, it's going to have to come from us. Uh, now, compared to this juggernaut toward genetic engineering, uh, the stem cell debate, which uh, many of you perhaps were part of, was, I think, a dry run. Uh, this, is, this is the big one. This is going to change the whole way in which humanity is seen in future generations. So how did we get here? You know, I think the foundation for this, sort of the gateway technology that opened up these possibilities, uh, began in 1978, the birth of baby Louise Brown, the first test tube baby allowed to be born alive. Uh, public attention was on the fact that a baby was born alive, not on the hundreds of embryos that had perished in order to produce that one live birth. Uh, it was promoted as a way for infertile couples to have a child. But the practice of IVF did two things that were game changers. First, it provided a supply of embryonic human beings who were out there in the laboratory to be produced, manipulated, and studied in the laboratory for the first time. And second, for those who engaged in the technique, not necessarily for the suffering and fertile couples who resorted to it, but for the, the scientists and technicians themselves, it helped build up the view of the embryo as a specimen, an object available for quality control. Uh, some of you may have seen the recent news story about two IVF clinics in uh, Ohio and California having to tell parents, having to tell couples that their freezer had malfunctioned and so their frozen embryonic children may be damaged or lost forever. Except the clinics didn't say embryo, they didn't say children and they didn't even say embryos. They said uh, this is a loss of tissue, it's a loss of specimens. To the parents it was the loss of children, but to those who day to day are getting used to treating the embryo as a product, uh, these were specimens. And in fact, just the year after baby Louise Brown was born, in the United States, we already had a federal advisory panel named by uh, what was then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare um, to offer advice on the kinds of experiments on IVF embryos that should receive federal funding. 
In fact, at that time, a lot of objections were raised and public sentiment was not very supportive. So the federal funds were not forthcoming for many years. Not until uh, 1994, the Clinton, re uh, Clinton administration with the Democratic House of Representatives reopened this whole issue. And they had a human embryo research panel appointed. I think the handout says human research, human embryo advisory panel. It was the human embryo research panel, HERP. And they recommended a wide variety of harmful experiments on human embryos, including stem cell research. That project was stalled then by the passage of the Dickey Amendment by Congress in 1995. The Dickey Amendment says no federal funds for research in which human embryos are created for research purposes or are harmed or destroyed or subjected to risk of harm greater than that allowed for a child in the womb. And by that standard, even IVF itself doesn't get federal funding. Uh, but the research, of course, continued with private funds. Finally, in uh, 1998, scientists figured out how to isolate stem cells from human embryos. They learned their lesson from having lost the debate back in 94 and 95. And this time, they didn't talk about this as a wonderful, interesting science experiment. They talked about it as a cure for dozens of diseases, uh, many of which it was impossible to even make an argument that, it, that this could cure it. But uh, they enlisted uh, major disease organizations to provide uh, the, 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 the foot soldiers for the lobbying campaign. And this time they got their wish of allowance for federal funding. And then they insisted this would only involve spare embryos left over from fertility efforts who would be thrown away otherwise. Uh, that wasn't even true. The, they were taking embryos that might, have, might well have survived. But uh, at that time, the secular newspapers, Washington Post, Chicago Sun-Times all said, yes, this is justifiable. What would be unconscionable, that was the word the Washington Post used, it would be unconscionable to specially create human embryos for research uh, specifically that would only destroy them. And then a few years later, they said, the scientists said, well, we might need human cloning to get tissues that match a patient that won't be rejected. And so we are going to have to specially create embryos just for research that will destroy them for their stem cells. And the Washington Post and all these other uh, agencies said, well, OK, uh, in order to fulfill the promise of stem cell research. We actually had to amend the Dickey Amendment to make sure that at least in terms of federal funding, the ban would cover cloned human embryos as well. And in the end, uh, efforts to ban human cloning uh, stalled because we wanted a real ban on human cloning and the scientists only wanted a ban on bringing uh, cloned embryos to live birth. So they could do all they wanted with the cloned human embryos, just you know, don't let any of them get out alive and nothing at all passed in terms of banning anything. So now the stem cell and cloning debates have moved into the background, but they're still out there as technology to help prepare the way for saying, well, okay, we can make a lot of embryos that are just like existing people. What if we could make embryos that are a lot better than existing people? Uh, so these have been the, the gateways to what is now known as CRISPR. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. If, you, if you've seen Mary Poppins, you can sing it. If you, sound, if you may say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious. Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Okay. Uh, the full name of this technique is CRISPR-Cas9. Cas9 is a CRISPR-associated protein. It's one of many. Basically, to put it in its simplest terms, CRISPR is a little genetic sequence that acts like a memory bank. It's used by bacteria to combat viruses. If a bacteria or its progenitors has ever uh, run into a virus before, and the viruses, of course, 
they invade a bacterium and then they use it as a, a vector, as a way of multiplying itself as a virus. Bacteria have a self-defense mechanism. They remember what the genetic profile of that virus looks like through this CRISPR sequence. And that is linked with this protein that cuts genes. So it goes right to the part of the virus that is attacking and it snips it and renders it ineffective. Scientists realize, well, if we could harness that, we could snip defective genes in humans and even then attach the healthy aspect, the healthy version of the gene and replace that, which is uh, wonderful, potentially wonderful, but uh, also potentially troubling in terms of the kind of power it gives some human beings over other human beings. As I said, this has developed very quickly. It was only discovered in 2012. By 2015, uh, the journal Science was calling this the scientific breakthrough of the year, and Chinese researchers were using it to alter the genome of dozens of what they called non-viable human embryos. Uh, U.S. researchers have used it to treat muscular dystrophy, dystrophy in mice. They've used it to alter rat stem cells that were then injected into mouse embryos who lacked the gene needed for developing a pancreas and allowed the mice to survive to maturity. And last year, it was used to treat age-related macular degeneration in mice. Last year also, right here in Oregon, Oregon Health and Science University, Researchers fertilized dozens of human eggs with sperm from men with a hereditary heart condition. And at the same time, they put in this CRISPR sequence with uh, sometimes with the healthy version of the gene, sometimes without. In fact, in some cases, you snip out the damaged gene, the DNA's own repair mechanisms will look for a place where there's a repair gene or a replacement gene, and they might take that from, they might take it from the mother's healthy version and put that in. So you don't even have to provide a new gene. It just, you snip the old one and uh, the rest happens naturally. But uh, they did succeed in getting some of the embryos to carry the corrected gene in at least some of their cells. And then they destroyed all the human embryos. Uh, as a sidelight, you can't really say that those embryos were cured by CRISPR because they found that uh, it's more effective if you put in the CRISPR sequence at the same time that fertilization is taking place. So they didn't cure an embryo that had the condition. They created a, a different embryo uh, that didn't have the condition. So they are specially creating embryos for research purposes. Uh, so this is something new, especially creating genetically tailored human beings whose genetic makeup from the beginning contains something man-made that would not have occurred naturally. The promise of this is enormous, and I don't want to uh, sugarcoat that, or, 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 you know, or actually I don't want to demean it. You could use it on people's existing born people's or unborn people's uh, body cells, you know, like at the fetal stage, to correct genetic conditions for that individual person. You could edit the human DNA at the early embryo stage, and then the corrected gene goes into all the cells of that human being, and because it also goes to the sperm and egg, all of the descendants of that human being, and that's called germline genetic engineering. It survives indefinitely into the future, and so do the mistakes. Uh, altering animal genes for human benefit, like altering pigs so their hearts, uh, other organs will have some human-like characteristics to make them capable of being transplanted into human beings without rejection. Fighting infectious diseases. They're talking about putting a, a gene, uh, a CRISPR gene out into mosquito populations in countries with a lot of malaria. And they use something called gene driving. That means this gene you're putting out into the environment dominates any other gene it comes in contact with. So it's always the dominant gene. It's always going to be exhibited in the future. You could make all mosquitoes 
in that whole country, maybe ultimately in the entire earth, infertile. Uh, you could destroy a species. Or you can make the mosquitoes unable to transmit malaria, which would be a little bit less uh, extreme. So the problems. There's the promise, and it's somewhat scary, but, uh, but also something that people would say, wow, we could, we could end all these diseases. But what are the problems? Well, first is safety and unintended consequences. There have been what they call off-target unintended genetic changes. Uh, one, sci one science journalist has noted that with germline modification, quote, even a small mistake could change the human gene pool forever. Uh, in 2016, the United States Director of National Intelligence listed this technology, gene editing, as a potential weapon of mass destruction. You could render everybody in a, you know, warring country infertile uh, and say, well, we're going to win that war in, you know, less than 20 years. Uh, second problem. The problem of this harmful and often lethal experimentation on early human beings. Currently, all the efforts to alter human embryos involve in vitro fertilization, which has its own very high embryo death rate. 80 to 90 percent of the embryos never uh, survive. And the clinics sort of tweak that by describing their success rate in terms of live births per cycle, but they put in several embryos per cycle in the hope that one will survive. And uh, now we're finding out, uh, well after the fact, that uh, kids conceived this way do have a higher risk of many genetic defects than for children conceived naturally. So here we are curing genetic defects. We're using a technique that actually produces more genetic defects. In this Oregon experiment at OHSU, women were enlisted to take risky superovulatory drugs that can uh, be, uh, can cause infertility in them, and even in some cases can uh, take their lives to produce many eggs at once for research use. But uh, last month, Scientific American says, don't worry because soon we may have a way to program ordinary skin cells to produce sperm and egg so that we can use them instead of natural sperm and eggs to make people to, ta to, uh, to design. Uh, so they tested the resulting dozens of embryos, found many to be healthy. They didn't have the heart condition. Uh, they, I mean, it's, it's by no means uh, uh, a reliable cure at this point. They reduced the likelihood of having the defect from 50% down to 28%. And when the experiment was done, they just destroyed all over 100 embryos, including the ones that they had corrected. And this is, this is the new model proposed by the National Academy of Sciences as one uh, headline in the science uh, news, uh, news site said, uh, the headline is, editing human embryos is okay, but don't turn them into people yet, geneticists say. Uh, and we know that, well, they were people. Uh, and in the scientific community now, the main debate is between that approach Let's keep throwing away the embryos until we know it's safe. And those who say, why do you even have to do that? Because we can do diagnosis of the genetic problems in the laboratory and then simply throw away all the ones that, uh, that have the defect. So you have a debate between one anti-life position and another, basically. There's, there's no third one. Third problem is this problem of moving from correcting an individual disease at the genetic level to making the, quote, better child, which uh, is exactly the same process. And you can figure out how to do that with exactly the same technology. And if it's improved for this purpose, it will be ready for the broader purposes, just as prenatal diagnosis, which was initially used for you know, very serious conditions, can be used to test for sex, as our opening keynote address mentioned, some people actually want sex-selective abortions and so on. Now, the scientific community itself is dominated by the technological imperative. If we can do it, then we should figure out how to do it. And they are assisted by this new industry of secular bioethics, which is dominated by 
a utilitarian perspective. The greatest good for the greatest number. You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs or embryos. You know, we ignore the costs now because we're going to produce great things in the future. Uh, Father Richard John Newhouse once said, the task of modern bioethics has been to, quote, guide the unthinkable on its passage through the debatable, on its way to becoming the justifiable, until it is finally established as the unexceptionable. Uh, and he said, those who pause too long to ponder troubling questions along the way are likely to be told that, quote, the profession has already passed that point. Uh, uh, my experience has been in the eyes of the experts who want to pursue these things. Moral concerns from the rest of us, uh, from the rest of us are always either too early. Oh, that's just science fiction. Why would you even think about that now? Or too late. Oh, you missed it, that window of about five minutes when you could have raised this, but now we're already putting it into practice and it's all in place. So we need a different moral compass for this than we get from some of these scientific establishment uh, figures. Uh, as I say, the debate that the academies of sciences want are the ones where they actually manage and control the debate. To get a very different perspective, let me spend a couple of minutes on uh, documents that have come out from the Catholic Church on this, not because I'm Catholic, though I am, but because uh, this is perhaps the religious organization that has uh, devoted the most systematic thought to this. Uh, and one pope in particular, Pope Pius XII, not a lot of people realize this, he was already seeing problems with in vitro fertilization back in the 1950s and saying this would not be morally acceptable because of the way it would demean and sort of dehumanize the product of, of human reproduction by taking it out of the context of this loving union of husband and wife. So he wasn't too late. Uh, I guess the scientists would say he was too early. Uh, but what he was mainly was ignored. Uh, he, was, he was just about right, but he was ignored. Um, the last three popes, John Paul II, Benedict, and Francis, have all raised these concerns in speeches and documents about the new powers of gene editing. Uh, with Pope Francis in his recent uh, encyclical on uh, the environment, uh, echoing uh, Pope John Paul II's statements and saying, and criticizing environmental activists who say we shouldn't have genetically modified foods, for example, and we should watch out about effects on the environment of trying to impose our technology on nature, but then they seem to think that anything goes when you're talking about human embryos. So uh, let me just summarize the consensus on this very briefly. Uh, and they're summarized in a, an instruction on bioethics that uh, came out in 2008 from the Vatican, Dignitas Personae, the dignity of the person. The first conclusion was, if you have informed consent, if you have a really careful assessment of the benefits and risks for the patient, procedures used on somatic cells, body cells, for strictly therapeutic purposes are in principle morally licit. So that's where you take someone who has a genetic tendency to a disease, for example, and you can take out their uh, blood cells and supply them with this missing gene through CRISPR and then put them back into the patient to find the cells where this gene is faulty and, uh, and correct them. Somatic cell gene therapy. And that's, that's pretty much uh, in a line with the model of human medicine we've had in the past. You have a condition, something that's going to cause a serious condition, you correct it, and that person is going to be better. Second, germline therapy. Well, that's different because the risks connected to any genetic manipulation are considerable and is not fully controllable. You could be putting this mistake out into a whole new generation and all future generations. So in the present state of research, uh, this instruction said it's not morally permissible to act in a way that may cause possible harm to the resulting progeny. And of course, it also noted that right now, gene editing of human embryos takes place only in league with in vitro fertilization and in league with deliberate destruction of large numbers of human lives. 
So in its current state, it's not being done in a morally acceptable way. Uh, very different from the scientific academy's judgment that it can be pursued as long as all the people you uh, supposedly helped are killed afterwards. Yeah. So some papal statements have noted it may be possible someday to correct genetic defects at the embryo or fetal stage for the child in the womb who was conceived without IVF. And uh, Vatican has urged that the benefits of genetic medicine be pursued in this way and not be made dependent, dependent on the problematic features of in vitro fertilization. But the, the problem about possibly permanently affecting future generations would still be there if it's done on the early embryo when uh, you don't have differentiated tissues and these changes go to every cell, including the cells that will become sperm and egg. Then there's that last and most problematic uh, issue, introducing alterations with a presumed aim of improving and strengthening the gene pool. And the instructions said some of these proposals exhibit a certain dissatisfaction or even rejection of the value of the human being as a finite creature and person, even aside from the technical difficulties and the risks, you're then promoting eugenic mentality, leading to social stigma against people who lack certain qualities while privileging qualities that happen to be appreciated by a certain culture or societies, qualities that do not constitute what is specifically human. Uh, and if you can imagine uh, the researchers at OHSU designing what we're going to put into the new, improved, perfect human being, it is almost certainly not going to be someone who's more like Mother Teresa. Okay. It's going to be a lot like uh, Shukrat Matalapov, who did the research. Uh, so uh, now are, there are some difficulties in applying these distinctions. The, some observers are saying that this line between therapy and enhancement is very difficult to negotiate. You know, well, okay, we're going to cure dwarfism. Okay, how, how about somebody who's just really short, uh, shorter than other people? Uh, what about improving? Okay, you can, you can alleviate Down syndrome. Well, what about somebody who's just going to have a lower than average IQ? Where do you draw that line? And there's a million questions like this about how would you do this for disease, but not do it for improving the race. Uh, I just want to end with a few references to cases where non-Catholic commentators have raised exactly these same warnings and these same concerns, sometimes decades ago, when people said it was science fiction. In some cases, it was written in science fiction books, but where now we have to take them a great deal more seriously. Uh, Dr. Leon Cass, who was once head of the President's Council in Bioethics, who is a, uh, uh, an ethicist of Jewish background, he's been warning against this trend for years, against making man himself what he calls the last of man's man-made things. He says it began with in vitro fertilization. In fact, he was testifying back in the 1979 hearings against pursuing IVF, and this... Uh, this prospect and now a bigger threat in the age of genetic engineering. There's a book-length study by the President's Council on Bioethics when he was chairing it called Beyond Therapy that outlines some of the dangers. It's available online. Uh, at a more popular level, and speaking a lot sooner, in the 1920s, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World presented a future where people are decanted instead of born where each one has been tailored to fit a certain, certain role in society. And interestingly, it's not to make everybody super smart and super able because they figured out, well, who does the, the dirty work then? So they actually tailor people to be uh, at different stages, from the ruling class of alphas to the simple working class gammas who have limited understanding of how they're being exploited. In that world, natural reproduction is seen as not only inefficient, but disgusting. What the future could look like in an age of voluntary genetic enhancement is explored by the film uh, Gattaca. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Gattaca. Okay, only a few. Really worth your time. Uh, in the future, genetic enhancement is available. It's not forced. 
There are some backward people for religious and other reasons who reproduce the old-fashioned way. But all the positions of power and responsibility end up being held by people who have been enhanced to be smarter, stronger, more efficient. Uh, and one young man who is among the naturally reproduced, they call him the invalids or the invalids, uh, he has aspirations to go into space, but uh, he would be screened out. So he purchases another person's DNA, samples of his hair and blood, his fingerprints and so on, and masquerades as him in order to meet his aspirations. I think the most interesting part of it is the guy who sold him the DNA, who was one of the perfect, but he got paralyzed in a car accident. And he has no reason to live because his whole reason for surviving was to be one of these enhanced perfect people. And now he has a disability and he cannot handle it. He's one of the invalids and he ends up committing suicide. So, you know, not, you can, couldn't have a more uh, colorful description of what we mean by stigmatizing people. Shortly after the end of World War II, finally, in the abolition of man, uh, C.S. Lewis was very prophetic in pointing out that it's all very well to celebrate man's increasing power over nature. But when he turns those skills onto other human beings, even trying to determine in advance what kind of people they will be through germline engineering, this will not be a net increase of power for humanity. It will be an increase of power for some men in one generation to control everybody else in all future generations, what their possibilities are. He wrote, each new power won by man is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. In every victory besides being the general who triumphs, he is also the prisoner who follows the triumphal car. So I'm, I'm here to say that this is really a new and alarming, not new in the imagination, but new in actual fact, an alarming kind of moral challenge that will have even more far-reaching implications than our battles over abortion, euthanasia, and stem cell research. It threatens to divide our society into new classes of the genetic haves and have-nots, the controllers and the controlled. Brave New World is on the horizon. We should not allow ourselves to opt out of the debate for fear that we don't know all the details of the science. In these other issues, we overcame that fear, we, we learned enough to join the moral debate, and we found we could influence that debate, capably and often successfully. We now have to be informed and morally engaged about the promise and peril of genetics, so the nightmare scenarios that are now only science fiction don't become reality. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have um, about 10 minutes for questions, at least, which is good. So you see a correlation between this and uh, the growing acceptance in Oregon uh, of saying, well, you can choose what sex you are or that you don't want to even be identified. I think the connection lies at a very deep level because increasingly we're being told that human nature is malleable, that it's changeable, that it's under our control. So, you know, if, if you want a child of this particular type, that's the child we will make, and you have control over that. And that's the promise and the peril of genetic engineering. So increasingly we have a generation of, of people who are growing up to be taught that they can choose everything about themselves. Their bodily reality is only an inconvenience. Uh, it may be okay for some, but uh, what you feel, uh, you should have a choice about remaking your humanity into what you think. There's a, there's a kind of rejection of the givenness of human life. And I think that's very alive in some of these fields of medicine as well, that well, the givenness of life is what they're combating. I was reading about uh, one of the scientists who, he's the CEO of a group called Genetic Prediction, and they're trying to make sure that 
through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, you can get not only, uh, you know, a, a, whether your child has a trisomy or some condition like that, but a whole profile of the tendency of your future child to, to get obesity, to be short or tall, to be smarter or not as smart as the average person. And then you get to choose whether that's the embryo that gets thrown away or, uh, or put into a womb. And this scientist says he was inspired to this by the movie Gattaca. And they say, oh my God, that's a, I mean, that's a nightmare scenario. Don't you realize the, the filmmakers, the filmmakers were warning us about this future. To him, it was a how-to. Uh, so yes, there is a mentality that says uh, either, I mean, I, and I think there's a certain amount of, uh, perspective on religion that sometimes goes with it, you know, that either God never existed or God is dead and we've inherited and we're going to be the new gods and, and make, you know, do a better job of evolution than he has. Uh, and so uh, it's, all, it's all part of the same thing. It, and that's, that's what we're all talking about in the pro-life movement is giving people those un inconvenient facts about realities that really do exist, even though they'd really like to ignore them. And that's true here as well. Oh, yeah. You ever read the, the, the novel The Children of Men by P.D. James? She imagines uh, something, except it was accidental, apparently, in that case. Yeah, what happens if somebody decides to splice up the genes to render us all infertile and lose humanity in one generation uh, in order to save the Earth, which is, you know, much more important? Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's the, the fear. I, I won't say this technique is so easy that you could do it in your, you know, garage, but almost, I mean, you can get it, you know, you can, you can buy these strands of DNA and uh, anybody with a decent lab can do this ultimately. And I think that's why the director of U.S. intelligence was calling it a potential weapon of mass destruction. Uh, you can, in fact, put out something, whether it's intentional or even whether it's an accidental mutation that could uh, not only change the human gene pool, but uh, wipe us out. And so for that reason alone, there are likely to be some severe regulations moving in on to what extent you can do this germline engineering. Currently, the way they're preventing that is by making sure no embryo gets out alive so that that can't get out into the population. But uh, that's not the way we want to be doing it. So it's, it's a dilemma. That's a good question about, you know, trying to say, say that some of the things we're doing now that people see as having good uses are actually based on a great deal of, of evil in the past. You know, I, I think one place you might go is for the whole debate after World War II. You know, I'm going to say the N-word, so don't get upset. Uh, I'm not calling anybody a Nazi. Uh, but the, uh, there was a big ethical debate about the use of the medical results from the Nazi medical experiments. And for the most part, uh, medical community, the bioethics community decided we just can't do it. I mean, it's, you know, they, and they said, well, it's probably not very useful anyway, but the, to, to use that information and to use those results would be to dishonor the victims. And, uh, and make us complicit, in a way, in that past evil. So our situation now is that it seems to me the evil things are going on now. And, uh, you know, in terms of the misuse and the destruction of, of human life. And so now is the time to speak up, because I think it will be harder when they say, okay, it's all refined. Now we can let the embryos uh, come to birth. We can let some of them at least live. It's going to be so much harder to argue that than to say here and now, this is an immoral way to pursue medicine. You need to do this another way. There is a success story on this in terms of the stem cell research debate, because at a time when embryonic stem cell research was seen as the royal road to cures, there were folks uh, in the pro-life movement and just you know good, decent scientists who said there's another way. And adult stem cells are now uh, treating a great many diseases. Embryonic stem cells are not in clinical use for anything in the U.S. 
And there was a new technique called induced pluripotent stem cell research that uh, does, any, if, if you have any special thing you think only embryonic cells can do, this can do it by reprogramming ordinary adult cells to act like embryonic cells. You never create or destroy an embryo. It was discovered by a scientist named Shinya Yamanaka in Japan, who was not a Christian, but he was in an IVF clinic one day. He was the father of two daughters that he loves very much and looked at a microscope. He was considering doing embryonic stem cell research. And he looked at the microscope at two embryos and he had this sudden flash of intuition these could be my daughters. And he said, I can't do this. We have to do it another way. And he found the other way within a couple of years, revolutionized the whole field, won the Nobel Prize for his discovery, and the funding and the attention has now shifted from embryonic stem cells to his technique. And even James Thompson, who first did the embryonic stem cell research in 1998 in the U.S. that that kicked off the whole stem cell debate, says it's wonderful to be alive, to have created a field of research and see it end as well. I'm very happy with this. I always had problems with this, but I didn't say anything because I thought it was the only way to do it. So, uh, you know, we can look to that and say, we should be looking into all of the prospects for doing the promising things without all this involvement of immoral activity and promote those and urge scientists to pursue them and urge governments to fund them and uh, see if we can get scientific advances in a way that does not demean the people that we're trying to help. Uh, well, pluripotent stem cell, that, that's the easiest one. Pluripotent stem cell is a stem cell, it's a, an early form of cell that ultimately, with the right signals, could develop into any of the different uh, cells in the body. And so, with this induced pluripotent stem cell technique, you can take an ordinary skin cell, you can direct it to form uh, liver cells or blood cells or nerve cells, whatever is needed for treating a condition, or immune cells to help somebody who has an autoimmune condition. So uh, the treatments that are now being done with adult stem cell research, oh, time's up. Uh, there are a lot of lists of these online. Uh, and one of the places you could look at is the Charlotte Lozier Institute, where David Prentice has done tremendous work on documenting all the advances in adult stem cells. In terms of uh, the gene therapy, I would say, since we don't have time, take a look online at just gene therapy and see what the latest things are. It's something new every day. Uh, blood diseases as well as uh, possibly autoimmune diseases and other things. But I guess we're out of time. Thank you so much.